Good evening and welcome to Houston Methodist DeBakey Studio for the CV Live Heart Failure Hour, a quarterly hour of conversations to conquer heart failure. I'm Arvind Bhimraj, your host, and I'm one of the advanced heart failure cardiologists here at Houston Methodist. And today I'm excited to announce the relaunch of our heart failure hour segment where we're going to focus on various aspects related to heart failure from the spectrum of medical management to advancements. And today it's a very timely topic that we're going to talk about revascularization in advanced heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, a path to myocardial recovery. I do want to introduce our guests today. I have with me today Dr. Alpesha, who is the director of coronary interventions and uh, I call him the guru of complex PCIs that he has done and we will have a, a presentation from him uh, after I set the stage about the, the topic and the relevance. Thank you Alpesh for being here today. Um, and then we also have Dr. Uh, Hassan Arshad who's our third year fellow who's going to be the interventional fellow next year who will discuss some cases relevant to our topic moderated by Dr. Shah and myself. So thank you all for being here and for those of you watching live, hope you enjoy the next hour. And then for those of you who want to rewatch it, this will be available on our Deveki YouTube channel. Uh, so you can always uh, spread the word to your friends and colleagues uh, about this uh, relevant uh, topic. So we'll move on uh, with, a, with a few of the slides from, from my side, talking about the relevance of revascularization uh, in advanced heart failure, and I call it a path to myocardial recovery because uh, opening up arteries is a context of restoring the myocardial blood flow and the myocardial viability. If you think about coronary artery disease in heart failure, it's been well established that we might not be thinking about CAD as much as we have to, and this is one of the studies that was done in a VA population showing that only about 40% of the time a new onset heart failure patient is getting an ischemic evaluation. This was also replicated in a recent Danish registry. And very interestingly and appropriately, individuals who got an ischemic evaluation had a better outcome on the long term. And it, it brings up to light that people with congestive heart failure might be set off in their journey of their disease, not knowing whether they truly have coronary disease or not. Which is why it opens up the bucket that when somebody goes through these stages of heart failure and they're going to stage D, I always clarify that advanced heart failure, which is stage D, in theory is broken down into advanced and end stage heart failure. I call it D1 and D2, there have been uh, segments where people have called C1 and C2, but if you think about the concept of advanced heart failure, you could be advanced in your risk prognostication, but not essentially all of them are declared end stage because there might be opportunities where you reset their trajectory from advanced heart failure to potentially not being end stage heart failure. And one of the interventions that could be done is a high risk PCI, Mitroclip has been done in a few cases of calling it as a mitra bridge trial, and some individuals actually end up <clears throat> being a good BIV responder. But today's discussion is relevant to the fact that it's never too late to think about revascularization in individuals who are labeled as advanced heart failure. To set the stage, and Dr. Shah will highlight this more, there are no clear guidelines for advanced heart failure in the context of revascularization. And of course, the, the literature has been controversial with a lot of studies, which he'll throw some light and educate us about it. And if you think about interventions for low EF and whether bypass surgery is an option, especially in advanced heart failure, I put this graph that you have on the left, which is the STITCH trial, showing that your five-year survival is about 65% once you have taken a high risk, uh, uh, mortality risk upfront compared to medical therapy. Interestingly, if you look at survival, and if somebody's advanced heart failure, you can presume that this five-year survival in patients will probably be higher if you're advanced heart failure. If you compare that to the current outcome 
from uh, patients with LVADs, the graph on the right is five-year survival of latest centrifugal flow pump. It's about 60%. So it begs to ask ourselves if somebody is advanced heart failure, putting them through a bypass surgery might be risk preclusive in my mind. Hence the validation of the fact that uh, you, you know, the PCI might be something to explore, which we'll talk more through the day. Uh, and of course, early risk is what uh, is incumbent, even in patients in stitch trial who are technically not advanced heart failure. So we have to keep that in mind. And more importantly, when the stitch trial had uh, a risk uh, assessment through the continuum, you can notice in these figures that the increase in the risk starts at a very low creatinine and also at a, at a level of end systolic volume index. And most advanced heart failure patients probably will be at a higher creatinine level. Hence, the outcome discussion uh, for these advanced heart failure patients needs to be uh, put in context. And of course, the, mo to add more controversy, the PCI revised BCIS2 study, which came out recently, almost kinds of kind of say maybe we shouldn't be doing any any PCI. So with a lot of these controversies, I think today is a very relevant discussion of what to do. And you know it the question becomes who wins the battle, medicines or PCI? And probably the easier question to answer might be who wins this battle. And of course we're gonna say Astros. So with with that as a, a stage that we set, um, I'm gonna uh, see if Dr. Shah has any comments uh, as he uh, uh, will pull up his presentation. So Dr. Shah, you know, I think today's discussion is definitely relevant and from the context of what we have, uh, what I talked about, what are a few of your thoughts on um, really how PCI is being used in heart failure versus not? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you Dr. Bimraj for inviting me. Um, that is a CV Life conference and opening up uh, doors to discuss such an important matter. If you think about ischemic cardiomyopathy, it's common sense, it's logic. You have a blockage, you fix the blockage, the heart was weak before, before the blockage was fixed and it should get better, right? Or is it that simple or is it not? Where are we flawed? What more we need to learn? What have we done historically? I think those are some of the things I'd like to highlight. So again, thank you for inviting and let me get to my slides. So first and foremost, as the Dr. Bimraj already said, there is a, th this data is a little bit old. Um, on, the, on the right uh, graph, you can see the non-invasive evalu evaluation of patients with new onset heart failure. And those tests are low, but at the bottom graph, you can actually see that any, th any test to assess coronary anatomy is hardly undertaken. And in my practice, I think this would be unheard. Obviously, I'm biased towards knowing coronary anatomy. That's what I do for a living. However, I think any man who is above the age of 55 and women with risk factors with new onset heart failure, I think it is obligatory for us physicians to consider doing coronary anatomy definition. So I hope we will continue to improve on those numbers. So we cannot have this topic and talk about this topic of revascularization in patients with low ejection fraction without talking about the STITCH trial. STITCH trial stands for Surgical Treatment for Ischemic Heart Failure Trial. It is very important to note that this trial started 20 years ago, 20, 2002, and completed by 2007. And what they did was they took about 1,200 patients and randomization was performed. Half of them re received cabbage with medical therapy and other half received medical therapy. Uh, I'm sure you all must have already thought as I'm presenting this that what does medical therapy mean 20 years ago? Probably not a whole lot, so keep that in mind. But that's what happened, these patients got randomized. And as you look at their data, they were a little bit younger patients, only 12% women, very typical of those trials from those days. Prior MI was 77%, diabetes 39%. Baseline NYHA, class 2 to 4, about 89%, so symptomatic patients. LVEF, 28%, 
less than 35%. Uh, and systolic volume index of 78 mLs per millimeter square. And multivessel disease present in three-fourths of those patients and proximal LED present in 68% of those patients. So what did Stitch tell us? First and foremost, the original design, the primary five-year result of Stitch, again, this is cabbage versus medical therapy in low EF patients, at five years, it actually showed no significant difference. What is also important to note that there was almost three times more higher mortality for the first 30 days, which is expected. I mean, if you're a patient going through cabbage with low EF, you're going to have some mortality event rate. So there was this initial bump, which was, which, uh, which was much higher than medical therapy are. However, as the data and those patients were followed up for 10 plus years, it was illuminating to know that there was a significant mortality, all-cause mortality reduction with cabbage, in the cabbage arm with a hazard ratio of 0.84 and a p-value of 0.001. In other words, you had to do 14 patients, numbers needed to treat 14 to save one life by choosing cabbage in this particular subgroup of patients. The relative risk reduction was 16%, absolute risk reduction is 8%. And the other way to look at this is that it extended the median survival to 18 months. So it can be very huge for that patient who benefits from this particular uh, cabbage. Cardiovascular mortality, again, something quite similar. Um, as you follow those patients out to 10 plus years, the hazard ratio is 0 0.79 in favor of cabbage uh, with a p-value of 0 0.006. Numbers needed to treat here is 11 and risk a relative risk reduction is 21% and absolute risk reduction of 9%. So again, continuing benefit at 10 years. But let's get a little bit more granular. Uh, so those are the big outcomes of stage, which is all-cause mortality and, and cardiovascular mortality. But then you always have to wonder, okay, so how does ischemia tie into uh, mortality outcomes in those two patients, uh, the sub subgroup of patients? Well, the benefit of cabbage over medical therapy only actually persisted and continued to be higher in, in all patients, whether they had ischemia present, documented, or did not have it. And similarly, for viability, the benefit of cabbage arm actually was irrespective whether there was viable myocardium or not viable myocardium, which was very interesting because in both the groups, cabbage turned out to have better long-term outcomes, at, especially at 10 years. Often we revascularize uh, these patients with the immediate hope that the EF will improve because that is what we are trying to achieve. And there was a slight improvement in the ejection fraction in the cabbage arm, but not statistically significant. So this benefits of patients, whether they are, they are with less mortality, um, was irrespective of recovery of LV ejection fraction in stitch patients. So keep that in mind. Now, you take this idea, you fast forward 20 years, you have all these fancy new stands and technology, and in the interim, you have all these papers, single centers, multi-centers, uh, and this is a meta-analysis which showed that cabbage was definitely much better than medical therapy with hazard ratio of 0.67, but even PCI was in this meta-analysis found to be better than medical therapy at hazard ratio 0.73, but cabbage continues to outperform in this particular study. But that led to this idea about, hold on, can we consider something less invasive such as PCI and would it have similar benefit, especially in mortality reduction in ischemic cardiomyopathy patients? And now we come to the current times, literally fast forward by 15 plus years. And that led to the revived BISIS-2 trial. It stands for revascularization for ischemic ventricular dysfunction. And the hypothesis is revascularization with PCI. It improves event-free survival in patients with severe ischemic LV systolic dysfunction compared to optimal medical therapy alone. This was conducted in, in Britain. Uh, 700 patients, they were, rand they were uh, randomized in 2013 and led, uh, went on until 2020. And Earlier this year, this data was present at the ESC, and subsequently it was also published in New England Journal. 
So all those patients had to have an LVEF of less than 35% with extensive CAD. So they used what is called a business jeopardy score, more than six. The score goes from zero to 12. And as you can imagine, the higher the score, the more complex and more multiple lesions those patients have. But also, unlike stitch, they actually wanted patients with viable myocardium. And that had to be documented by current state-of-the-art imaging technology, whether it's CMR or WM stress echo spect or PET. And then PCI, this was an inclusion criteria that PCI has to be feasible to lesions subtending more than four dysfunctional but viable segments. And they got randomized to PCI versus optimal medical therapy. And eventually they had clinical outcomes, including echo and follow-up data. So the inclusion criteria, just to go over one more time, chronic heart failure, LVF less than 35%, extensive CAD. So these are not patients with minimal one or two lesions, at least four segments of viable myocardium, very important, very different from stitch and heart team does not recommend cabbage. Primary endpoint was death, MI, and, and heart failure hospitalization. Exclusion, acute heart failure. So this, this, this study did not include patients with STEMI, cardiogenic shock, so on and so forth, uh, Canadian uh, angina, severe angina, hemoglobin less than nine, or GFR less than 25. So those patients were excluded in this trial. The primary outcome was defined as all-cause death or hospitalization for heart failure at a minimum of 24 months. Uh, and the main secondary outcome was LV ejection fraction at 6 to 12 months and quality of life at 6 to 12 months based upon Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. These are some of the baselines. Uh, I just want to highlight between the PCI and the medical therapy group. Um, again, these are a little bit elderly compared to the stage trial patients, uh, about a decade older uh, than that subgroup of patients. Uh, diabetes was present in about 40% of those patients. LV ejection fraction was 27%. Um, interestingly, NYHA class 1 and 2 was noted to be in 70% or 77% or 71%. So very high. So not very symptomatic patients when you just think about congestive heart failure. Um, and the Jeopardy score mean was 10 in both the groups. But they also, unlike a lot of these other trials, they also included left main coronary artery disease, which accounted uh, for quite a, quite a number of patients and proximal LED as well. So very impressive in terms of high-risk anatomy in this patient. So what did it show? And this, uh, as I said, got published in New England Journal earlier this year, and this is the outcome. The outcome uh, with a median follow-up of 3.4 years does not show any uh, improvement of uh, or reduction of all-cause death or heart failure readmissions in patients randomized to PCI versus op optimal medical therapy. The event rates were about 37%, 38%, and not dissimilar at all between these two groups. In other words, the primary endpoint did not show any statistical difference. Let's look at some of the subgroups. We are hoping sometimes as PCI operators that there must be some subgroup. What about those patients with multiple uh, disease, high jeopardy score, really low ejection fraction, maybe diabetics, maybe patients who are much more symptomatic, did that show any improvement with PCI? Well, actually not. So again, uh, very interesting finding, uh, but every subgroup did not, uh, does not show any benefit of doing PCI. Completeness of revascularization, which is often a hot topic whenever we talk about this kind of uh, trials. Again, uh, whether there was, it was achieved or not achieved, there was no difference in the outcomes. Now, the major secondary outcome of LVEF, and I, I find this most interesting because we expect LVEF to improve and maybe we can tie that into mortality reduction, at least in our mind. Well, LVEF did improve slightly with PCI and maybe it stabilized. But however, when those patients were followed at six months and 12 months, there was actually no statistically significant difference between the medical therapy or the PCI group in improvement of LVEF. Disappointing, but very thought-provoking. What about symptoms? What about Kansas City cardiomyopathy quality of life score? Well, as you can see, there is definitely an initial bump at six months. Most patients felt better. However, it plateaued. After those first six months, patients said, well, I'm okay. However, there was a continuing benefit of optimal medical therapy up to two years and the graph started converging, which is also very interesting. Unplanned revascularization was definitely higher in the optimal medical therapy group. 
uh, we found uh, 10 events which, uh, uh, which led to uh, in, in the PCI group, but 37 events were found in the optimal medical therapy group, much higher on plant revascularization. So what is the conclusion of revived BCIS2 trial? Number one, patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy continue to have high rates of mortality, very high rates. Even in today's day and age, we are talking about a mortality rate nearing 32 to 36 percent. Hard to imagine, hard to accept, but that is what BCIS2 revived showed. And hospitalization for heart failure, even with contemporary medical and device therapy. Mind you, they are very lenient. They allowed for all sort of advances in medical therapy and even device therapies to be included in this study. PCI, however, did not reduce the composite incidence of all-cause death or hospitalization for heart failure at a medium of 3.4 years. And PCI did not incrementally improve LV ejection fraction. Hard to accept, but that is what this trial showed, or provide a sustained difference in quality of life. Spontaneous MI and unplanned revascularization were more frequent with medical therapy. So you look at this kind of data and you have to say, well, what can we do better? Well, this is not a new, new, new concept. We have been trying to achieve, we always believed in this kind of patients with low EF, complete revascularization has to be one of our goals. And this is, this is a uh, meta-analysis, a ginormous meta-analysis of 89,000 patients. And they basically studied of patients who had uh, subjects who had gone through complete revascularization versus in, incomplete revascularization, whether it's cabbage or PCI. So 35 RCD subgroups were an observational study data here. Incomplete revascularization was achieved, uh, or remained in 56% of the cases, and in cabbage only 25%. So that is a massive, massive work to be done for the PCI field. And hence, mortality, when you completely revascularize, favored with a hazard ratio of 0.71, MI favored at 0.78, repeat revascularization favored at 0.74. Again, this particular meta-analysis does not have data on EF or heart failure status. However, there is a clear benefit of complete revascularization. So then the question comes, how do we do better job at complete revascularization if the patient comes to the cath lab? And that has led to this idea, this concept, the revolution of the last decade and a half of mechanical circulatory support devices. I presented this slide to show you guys what, uh, what, what is out there. This is a general scheme of things. The first two mentioned on the left are the Impel RP and the Tandem Heart RARPA, which I'm going to not talk, discuss today because they are mostly for the right ventricular support. But let's move on to intraaortic balloon pump. As you know, it uses seven to eight French sheets and it is a fair, maybe not the most effective, but maybe fair effective way of doing LV unloading. Impella, which has been revolutionary in our field, whether it's 2.5 to CP and 5.0 and 5.5, a much larger French, um, but it is one of the best uh, modalities we have today of LV unloading. Tandem heart, which basically connects left atrium and requires a transeptal puncture to the femoral artery or the aorta, uh, is also an excellent unloader of the LV. VA ECMO, which is used much, much more commonly over US, uh, is much better at improving oxygenation, but not necessarily great at uh, LV unloading. If anything, it is good at RV unloading. Now, that being said and done, we have all these devices, so trials started coming on. This is one. This was the original BCIS-1 trial, again done, conducted in Britain with about 300 patients with EF less than 30% and extensive CAD. They were undergoing PCI and they were randomized to intraaortic balloon pump versus control in, in UK centers. And the primary endpoint was in hospital MACE. So what did it show? No difference. The p-value turned out to be not statistically significant and that was a composite of MI, death, CVA or even further revascularization. And procedural complications including procedural hypotension was noted which also led to crossover to intraaortic balloon pump in this particular trial. So not a clear benefit of intraaortic balloon pump supported PCI in ischemic heart failure patients. However, as Impella started coming to the, uh, uh, getting approved, we get, got into this PROTECT2 trial. This was done in 2007, 2007 to 2010, and these patients required prophylactic hemodynamic support during non-emergent high-risk PCI on unprotected left main, last patient conduit, and LV ejection fraction less than 35%, or three-vessel disease and LVEF less than 30%. So they were one-to-one -one randomization. 
one arm gas intraaortic balloon pump with PCI, the other arm gas impel, impel at 2.5 with PCI and primary endpoint was 30 day and 90 day composite of major adverse event which was a whole sum of death, MI, uh, stroke TI, repeat revascularization, cardiac or vascular operations or vascular operation for limb ischemia, acute renal dysfunction, increase in aortic insufficiency, severe hypotension, VT, angiofilar. So, uh, amalgamation of a lot of different types of events were, com uh, were accounted as primary endpoint. So, at 90 days, the composite major adverse event rate was substantially lower, substantially lower, about 22% with a p value of 0 0.02 in the impella group compared to the IABP group and also the quality of life improved in 8 out of 10 patients. About 22% of those patients had a significant LV ejection fraction improvement. That is something we have not seen much in stitch and obviously not in revived but in this particular trial there was a 22% improvement with a p-value of point, less than 0 0.001 in ejection fraction in, at follow-up. Not only that, the NYHA class improvement was significant. Almost 59% of the patients were class 3 or 4 heart failure symptoms were, redu were reduced uh, significantly by in, in the Impella, Impella group. That led to the next trial which was called PROTECT-3 and that also coincided with the launch of Impella CP. Uh, it used some of the historical data from uh, PROTECT-2 trial and it showed just like uh, PROTECT-2 that there was a continuing benefit of using Impella 2.5 or more, more likely CP over use of intraortic balloon pump in, in such patients and major adverse events. So where does MCS or mechanical cardiac support for high risk PCI, what are the potential benefits? Well number one, the clear cut is hemodynamic support. So what that allows us in the cath lab is to reduce procedural complications. It improves early outcomes. What else? It enables optimal lesion selection and stent implantation, it gives us more time. It facilitates use of physiologic lesion assessment and intravascular imaging, which often does not happen when patients are sick. And also, most importantly, it allows for complete revascularization with the hope and belief that these kind of technological advances will lead to better improved late outcomes. There is reduction of restenosis, strength thrombosis, and improved LV function uh, recovery, which eventually should lead to reduction of MACE, heart failure, arrhythmias, hospitalization and a better quality of life. One of the other benefit is also renal protective effects. There is reduced acute kid kidney injury as well as long-term renal preservation. Well, so we have all this data. So where does MCS for high-risk PCI? What do the guidelines say? Well, surprisingly, 2021 AC ACCHA guidelines say that in selected, in selected high-risk patients, elective insertion of an appropriate hemodynamic support device as an adjunct to a PCI may be, may be reasonable to prevent hemodynamic compromise during PCI. And hence, it only gets a class to B level of evidence B. Well, why that? Why that? Well, that, the reason is that it, during PROTECT-2, it was halted. It was halted for futility after an interim analysis showed no benefit in the primary endpoint. And that has left a big dagger to this field. ESC guidelines are worse. There is actually no specific mention of MCS in high-risk or non-SOC patients. This is a protected PCI algorithm which I've derived from Jamie Meckham, my good friend at University of Washington. And this is what he has used and we kind of have followed, uh, a lot of physicians have started using this. So anybody who comes to the cath lab with the EF of less than 50%, evaluate this algorithm. Strongly encourage that. If the EF is less than 40%, consider doing a right heart cath prior to PCI. But he was able to identify some of these risk factors and calculate a score. For example, somebody with a very low cardiac index of less than two, the sole vessel as a conduit where you're going to do a PCI, EF of less than 25%, hypotension, ACS presentation, planned revascularization of more than two territories, prolonged ischemia such as retrograde CTOs or atherectomy cases, severe mitral regurgitation, decomposited state with LVDP more than 20, and significant orthopnea where somebody cannot lay on the table, they all get a score, plus one or plus two. But to the contrary, if somebody has high risk for vascular injury or significant bleeding, they get a minus one score. Hemoglobin, pre-existing anemia, less than eight. They get a minus one score. Then you add up this score, if it is zero to one, unlikely to need support, two may consider support, but three or more strongly consider support based upon this algorithm. This has led to Restore EF trial, which is another of the ongoing trial 
which looks at complete revascularization in a single setting with atherectomy, large bore access techniques. And again, this is ongoing, but there are some interim data which I like to share. LVEF improvement at 90 days in restore EF patients using Impella as a support is significantly better in the Impella group with p-value again less than 0 0.0001. At the same time, the heart failure symptoms significant improvement at follow-up just as seen in the other PROTECT trials as well as significant improvement in angina symptoms. This trial is not completely finished. We are looking forward to more data coming up from this group but also complete revascularization was associated with significant improvement in LV ejection fraction. This uh, bars basically show that if your residual syntax score is less than five, so much better improvement ejection fraction versus somebody with a residual syntax score of less than, five, uh, more than five. The, one of the exciting trial, which is the national PI's Dr. Greg Stone, is called the PROTECT-4 trial. Uh, we'll be enrolling about 2,500 patients in US and we'll be randomizing patients with ejection fraction less than 25 percentage to uh, Impella CP or the control group, which is intraortic balloon pump or not even any um, MCS. And there'll be an ongoing simultaneous registry. They'll be followed up for with echo along with uh, quality of life and renal function. So we are hoping that by providing hemodynamic stability during high-risk complex PCI, Impella will facilitate an improved stent optimization and more complete revascularization that will translate into improved and early and late outcomes with the hope that that will maybe move the guidelines, maybe move the needle a little bit. So I want to conclude my talk with a couple of last slides because this has become such a hot topic. And again, thank you for Do Dr. Bimraj for inviting us. Um, to discuss this in his forum. He's a heart failure specialist. So this is very impactful to thousands and thousands of patients as to how we revascularize once we identify severe CD. So what has stitched? What has revived? What does it mean to us today? Is cabbage preferable over PCI? Well, first and foremost, we cannot, as always we say, don't, don't compare apples to oranges. There is no PCI in stitch, and there is no cabbage in revived. And there is a major limitation I wish especially revived that they included cabbage group. Nonetheless, second is medical therapy for advanced in revived compared to stitch. In revived is an ongoing. So you have ARNI available, SGL2 inhibitors available, and those patients were allowed and added those very advanced heart failure medications. Now, is it possible that stitch had such a benefit long term, especially because medical therapy arm was just not efficient or well enough to compare? and revived arm did, we do not know that answer, but that is important to note. Not only that, use of ICD or CRT device used in revived, but not in stitch as much. There is a concern that mortality has not effectively reduced with optimal medical therapy in almost a decade. And I'll let Dr. Bimraj ponder over that as to why that has not happened, but at least our studies in the PCI or the revascularization study continues to struggle with this. Also, revived show no mortality benefits in stable ischemic heart disease with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Hold on, stable ischemic heart disease, when was the last time PCI showed any mortality benefit? It does not, because PCI, as we all know, only can fix a lesion which is flow limiting or stenotic. It does not address the non-flow limiting lesions which are often the culprit for subsequent ACS or MIs. So this is this data in mortality, no benefit from mortality, is actually not much different from courage or ischemia. Surprising though, very surprising to me personally, because we have a lot of patients and maybe Dr. Arshad will teach us more or show us more some of those cases, to see lack of EF improvement in the PCI arm. Did Revive miss out on advanced ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, more symptomatic, more ischemic? Because 77% patients had only NYHA class one or two who really do really, really well with guideline directed medical therapy hard to compare that with PCI or an invasive approach, which comes with, with its own prices. Is it important to revascularize viable territory, which is what is done in revived, or viable and ischemic therapy? I think that is very important for us to uh, ask. So where do guidelines stand today in US with patients with EF less than 35% of stable ischemic heart disease? A, US guidelines, cabbage is class one, level of evidence B, for ischemic cardiomyopathy and multiversal disease. Now, you may wonder, how in the world did CABBAGE get this guideline? Because stage five-year outcome was actually not that different, but 10-year has moved the needle for CABBAGE and some of the other single-center and multi-center registries. 
However, PCI has no direction in the US guidelines. It is reserved, however, for surgical high risk with the heart team approach. ESC guidelines, on the other hand, are a little bit more granular. Cabbage is class one with level of evidence B for ischemic cardiomyopathy and multivessel disease for acceptable cardiac risk. PCI is class 2A with level of evidence C for ischemic cardiomyopathy and one or two vessel disease with ischemic cardiomyopathy with the intention of complete revascularization. However, PCI can be considered with heart team approach in patients with three vessel disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy. So how are we doing this at Houston Methodist Cath Lab? Number one, it is super, super important for us to have a heart team approach. The heart failure faculty leads, interventional cardiologists, cardiovascular surgery, electrophysiology, so on and so forth. And we, every patient ought to be addressed in this approach, whether cabbage, PCI, or medical therapy is the best, best offer, best, best thing to offer. Timing of PCI is very important. It is, it is important that kidneys are better, hemoglobin is better, patients are more stable, they can lay flat on the table, mechanical support is vetted out, things like that is very important for good, successful uh, uh, outcomes. Planning MCS, SC, MCS, as I mentioned, is also very helpful, optimizing comorbidities. And I would strongly encourage that such kind of complex cases are best taken at places which do complex PCI center so that we can achieve complete revascularization by fixing CTOs, atherectomies, so on and so forth. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Bhimaraj. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I think that was a, a overwhelming but comprehensive discussion of, of really all the areas of controversy that we have. And I think uh, even though a, a lot of these uh, almost has been an up and down on where the evidence lies, I think it's important to acknowledge that when there is limitation in evidence, you have to go back to the drawing board on what best suited for your patient. I think the guidelines are good recommendations. And in the context of some of the more advanced heart failure, even though the topic is advanced heart failure, there's really not much evidence. But it's important to know that the data that Dr. Shah mentioned is relevant to patients with low ejection fraction, but most were quite stable. But even in that area, if the evidence is, is, is shaky and going in which direction, I think uh, it comes down to an individualized approach with a heart team approach for each patient and, and going back to some of the conceptual framework. So thank you for that overview. We do have some questions from our audience uh, which we can maybe uh, address before we move on to the cases. So I think the first question is about in stitch and revive patients, was there no difference in wall motion abnormalities before revascularization and at long-term follow-up after revascularization. Um, and and I, Dr. Shah, I, I think there was a wall motion score that was used to enroll patients, Correct. but uh, I'm not sure if there was a follow-up to compare the wall motions, uh, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was a wall motion to enroll, but at the end of the trial, they just looked at the EF. They did not follow up with the EF. It is interesting to me, and Dr. Shah, we, we consider about viability testing and, and uh, there was a sub-study from STITCH even that after in patients who had viability or did not have viability, both of those patients, the EF did not go up uh, post revascularization. So that is kind of interesting to me that we have now two trials and in those, both the trials in patients who had viability and stitch and revived was all viable, that the EF did not go up. So I, I think the ejection fraction in general in heart failure is, a, is, is something that we become centric on. And, and it's not surprising to me because even in, in general heart failure trials, if you look at guideline directed therapy, not many studies have shown mm. an EF improvement. And if you look at uh, real-world evidence, only about 33% of individuals on GDMT improve their ejection fraction. So I think opening up arteries, will it improve the ejection fraction finally? Or despite not improving the ejection fraction, can you translate into better outcomes? I think becomes a complex decision making. Yeah. Um, and then the other question that came through actually opens up some of those discussions on you know, are we using the right criteria or cutoffs for significant stenosis? 
right? Mm. And and uh, you know, talking about uh, visual stenosis versus FFR based versus metabolically active uh, opens up this whole area of are the right lesions being revascularized. Yeah. So so that that's a fascinating question. Uh, we struggle with that in the cath lab quite a bit. Um, on one hand, we we don't want to stand lesions which are stable mm -hmm. because the minute we put in a stand we make that lesion unstable for its life now so it is very important to use some of the current modalities available whether it's imaging or physiologic lesion assessment ifr ffr so on and so forth mm -hmm. to better characterize and see if that will allow you to be more sophisticated in choosing uh, lesions to fix one of the advantages of coronary artery bypass surgery is because it, it bypasses a potential minefield of multiple plaque ruptures in the subsequent 5-10 years. Maybe that's why it, it continues to hold true over time. Um, but that being said and done, I think going after lesions which may not be stenotic uh, is, is, is a tough, tough uh, task because you do not want to go after uh, standing lesions which are a, not stenotic. Unfortunately, our science is not advanced enough to truly understand what is vulnerable versus what is not. If we ever conquer that field, we understand that field, we'll be much better off. No, thank you, Dr. Shah, for those comments. Uh, uh, with all these controversies and question mark whether medicines are equal to PCI or not, maybe Dr. Arshad still has time to change his mind uh, <laughs> to go to heart failure cardiology <laughs> instead of interventional. Uh, but I think, I think we'll move on to the cases because you know, understanding the, the evidence and physiology and what we have and then translating into especially cohorts of patients who are complicated and might not even fit in any of these trials because if you're much sicker in, in shock or in heart failure, uh, none of yeah. they were not included in these trials. And in those situations, <clears throat> as a heart failure cardiologist, you're weighing your decisions on alternative options, which becomes things like LVAD and transplant. And I always say, even though we're advanced heart failure transplant cardiologists, our main goal is to avoid transplant on LVAD, and sometimes the revascularization, as reflected in some of these cases, might be an option. So we'll move on to Dr. Arshad's case presentations and case discussions, which will be moderated by Dr. Shah and me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mimraj. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Um, wonderful uh, discussion we have. I'm Hassan. I'm one of the cardiology fellows and we have three interesting cases for you um, so the first one so we are going to give try to give you a different flavor of all the uh, different pathologies from really sick advanced heart failures to kind of outpatient so this first case that we're presenting is an inpatient advanced heart failure consultation and uh, this is a 75 year old veteran with hypertension presented to our ER with the chief complaint of dyspnea and exertion. Um, for the past three months, he had noted some dyspnea and some orthopnea, um, which was worsened. Um, and he does mention that his blood pressure for the last year or so has been kind of unchecked, uncontrolled between 140s and 180s occasionally. He takes lisinopril 20 milligrams, hydrochlorothiazide 25 milligrams daily. Um, physical examination, um, just like heart failure, bread and butter heart failure, labored breathing, elevated JVD, an S3 gallop with bilateral rails and uh, three plus edema up to the knees. Um, and he had a draining venous ulcer. Actually, it is interesting that the venous, draining venous ulcer is what really concerned him and actually brought him, made him more concerned because he had been living with that dyspnea and exertion for a while. His labs uh, were notable for a creatinine of uh, 1.23 and, um, and uh, GFR was low, BNP was high, and his high sensitivity proponents were mildly elevated at 41. Um, he, um, on EKG, as you all can appreciate, he was on 2 to 1 atrial flutter um, um, and otherwise um, no second event ST changes or ischemic changes, but he was in uh, two to one typical atrial flutter. Uh, moving on to his echocardiogram. Um, so this is his contrast echocardiogram. You can see that he has 
Um, his LV is moderately to severely enlarged, and his global biplane ejection fraction came out to be 27%. Um, and there is some suggestion of uh, some regionality in the anterior interoceptum. Uh, however, you know, it is very difficult to um, tease out if there's uh, significant regional wall motion abnormalities. Um, so all for all purposes, this was uh, EF severely depressed and we don't see the RV really well in these uh, limited uh, views but the RV was also depressed and uh, in the bottom half of the screen you can see that the he had elevated LV filling pressures. Um, so with that the creatinine being high uh, we adequately diuresed him um, however we had some difficulty putting him on GDMT he wasn't really tolerating GDMT very well um, uh, at this time, he was on digoxin and Lasix, which he was tolerating, but he wouldn't tolerate any beta blockers. And by that de definition, makes him a very advanced heart failure patient. Um, we moved on to a right heart catheterization. Here we, so this is post diuresis. And uh, at that time, he had um, a uh, right atrial pressure of five and uh, uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressures of 28 by 12, mean PAP of 19, um, and a wedge of 10. So he was adequately diuresed. However, you can see that both on thermo and FIC, his cardiac output and cardiac indices were low. Um, his pulmonary vascular resistance was within normal range and his SVR was high. So given that he was a new onset heart failure, there was some suggestion of regional wall motion abnormality. So um, we went to cardiac catheterization and I'm gonna show you those images. Um, um, so this is um, also to consider that this is a patient with high creatinine. So we had to be um, conservative with our shots. We have this um, LAO cranial shot and uh, what you can see is uh, if you can see my cursor, there's a diffuse atherosclerotic mid-LAD lesion. Um, however, the distal LAD is healthy. It has mild luminal irregularities, um, but this mid-LAD has a severe calcified stenosis. Going to the caudal shot, you can see the ostium of the circ, and the ostium of the circ, you can see that that has significant stenosis. You can't really appreciate it, but there's also in this OM branch, um, right after there was a significant suggestion of stenosis right here. So in all in all, we're dealing um, right now in the left system with an LAD stenosis, mid-LAD stenosis, as well as um, two lesions, osteal circ lesion and a lesion in the OM, which is actually supplying a good amount of territory in the infralateral wall, uh, giving bifurcating LPLs. So this is the shots of the right coronary artery. Um, and let's see. So as you can see, so this is a um, RCA CTO. So it, it, there are two tandem lesions in the, in the prox to mid, and finally it is a CTO of the RCA. We did see some collaterals from the left right, and we do see on this RAO shot some collaterals, right to right collaterals filling the distal RCA. There's this CTO has a, a RV marginal branch at the proximal cap. Um, so I would say that there is some ambiguity about the proximal cap, but this is um, maybe a JCTO one or two or of um, RCA CTO, mid RCA CTO. So with that angiography, we took a pause and uh, we wanted to assess if uh, there is really viability in this RCA territory. Um, and and otherwise so we went with the cardiac MRI the cardiac MRI the cine images are top and the LGE images are on the bottom and um, as you can see the cine images um, are showing again this EF is uh, is reduced um, and the RV function is also depressed um, however we did not see much scarring in the inferior wall um, so if you can see that there is a hint of less than 25% of scar in the inferior wall, which you can also see here and here. 
So there is less than 25% of scar, but it does not reach to the entire thickness of the inferior wall uh, when we looked at the two chamber view to suggest that there was viability in uh, the inferior wall and LAD and CERC territories were completely viable. With that, the patient actually went for atrial flutter ablation first because um, that was that. And then we hydrated so that the patient's creatinine could get better. The first, um, so we then made a plan of doing uh, multi-vessel complete revascularization for this patient. Uh, first, we went for the CTO PCI of the RCA. Uh, and um, this was done with minimal contrast. Um, it was about 30 to 40 cc's of contrast that was used in the entire case. Um, and um, you can see uh, we did a radial femoral approach. And uh, this is our initial, after crossing the CTO, um, uh, this is our initial shot from the left system to confirm that yes, we distally we are intimal. And after that, uh, finally, we did an IVAS guided PCI to the RCA, uh, and you can see this is an excellent result. You have the PDA open and the LPLs and the RV marginal branches open. Um, so next uh, was the stage procedure after a couple of weeks. Um, as outpatient, we did um, this ostium circ as well as the OM. So there are so again, I was guided PCI to the OM as well as the CERC, and we did a PCI to the LAD. Um, and you can see uh, we had good angiographical results. Um, and I, I don't think we, we left him with much syntax score, uh, residual syntax score. There was no um, other significant lesions, and there was, uh, and we achieved complete revascularization with him. So this is at one week after complete revascularization. This is when we saw him in the first time in the clinic. Um, you can see that there is still some hypokinesis of the apical and anterior wall, but this inferior wall um, has, there's normalization of regional wall motion abnormality uh, of the inferior wall. At that time, the biplane ejection fraction was 36%. And this is um, when I saw him in the clinic with Dr. Shaw, um, actually a couple of, uh, actually last week, and his ejection fraction has completely normalized. His grade, um, his diastolic dysfunction, his LV filling pressures are normal. And as you can see on this um, upper left, his apex has, is, uh, is, normal kinetic, the interlateral wall is good, and also the inferior infraceptal walls are good, and the infralateral wall is also normal. And then this, this ejection fraction is the biplane ejection fraction that we got, given that it was not contrast, was 55%. Um, and in clinic, he was NYHA class one, doing well cardiac standpoint, yet in three weeks of cardiac rehab already, um, no new or worsening lower extremity swelling, no palpitations. His creatinine, and, and, and this was a success after these revascularizations, his creatinine, um, given, granted that when initially he came in, it was some sort of uh, a renal congestion, but after all these revascularization work, which we did cautiously, his creatinine remains to be normal, his GFR is 72, and um, he continues uh, on GDMT for heart failure with the recovered EF, which is very important. And we, we kind of make a note and that we keep them on GDMT even after their um, EFs have recovered. Uh, and he continues to be on uh, dual antithrombotic therapy for atrial flutter, which is, I think, one, mile, one or two months out of ablation and plavix. And he continues on antihyperlipidemic therapy with a target LDL goal of less than 70. Uh, that's a great case. I think uh, we can probably have a few points of discussion before we move on to the other sure. case. I think the, the, as a heart failure cardiologist, the first thing I would commend is um, you should never 
hesitate to do an invasive angiography in some of these individuals because I see often that a non-invasive testing sometimes gets picked and then you're left with some of these controversies of what's true, what's not. Yeah. Um, and then my, my question to uh, Dr. Shah is, um, in, in these situations when the myocardium is, a, is relatively in jeopardy and you're taking up a higher risk PCI, are you standardly doing IVUS based PCI and is that the current recommendation or it's so that the, the world needs to know what to do? I think IVUS based PCI is my norm in all PCIs. It should be the norm for all the operators. Uh, it is, we believe it's the fourth generation of our standing technique where one addi additional imaging modality reduces stent complications, uh, better short term and long term outcomes. So we always perform, perform every PCI with IVUS guidance. Uh, but besides that, I think this was a very th well thought out case. I had almost forgotten about this, but this had the classic multidisciplinary involvement. Mm -hmm. We thought through every step of the way. We didn't rush this. The patient had initiated uh, stabilization of medical therapy uh, led by the heart failure group. EP group was involved. Correct. We were involved. And, and so on and so forth. And then we aimed for RCA revascularization first. We thought let's at least stabilize him so that that actually makes the left-sided intervention less right. riskier yeah. if that some, there were some complications. And I, I think it has really worked out, worked out really well. In all honesty, sometimes you always ponder about what has actually led to the EF improvement. It could be multitude of factors. Obviously, guideline related medical therapy, which is doing so well on, patient's own efforts, cardiac rehabilitations, atrial flutter ablation, so on and so forth, and obviously uh, complete revascularization, and that was our aim. So, um, uh, fantastic case, yeah. yeah. No, thank you, Shad. So, we'll move on to the other cases. Uh, I know we're, we're at the hour, but I think we'll probably go on a little bit to okay. uh, review some of these cases quickly. So, uh, the second one is um, one of our outpatient advanced heart failure referral. Um, this was a 76-year-old female. She presented with new onset dyspnea for, uh, for about two months. Um, she had an EF at outside hospital of about 20-25%, and she had also moderate right internal carotid artery um, stenosis and uh, a cardiac catheterization, uh, which was done in March 2022. Um, it showed that there was some moderate RCA disease and an LAD diagonal bifurcation disease. Um, she also had breast cancer um, and she had COPD with 65 pack year history and CKD with a creatinine of 2.59 and a GFR of 19. So this was, um, this was sent out to us uh, for multidisciplinary discussion as well as to um, to see and and you can see on the EKG that she has some um, uh, lateral wall T wave inversions and th this was a challenge for us to see what is really her cause of dyspnea and exertion is the COPD really getting better or worse uh, or this is coronary artery disease uh, the baseline echocardiogram images um, we can see here um, um, the EF is in 20s to 25s, large dilated LV, and the RV systolic function is um, poor. And um, after after much thought of severe advanced COPD, we did pulmonary function testing, and um, 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 with her um, history of cancer and low EF, I think um, she was deemed as, as an appropriate candidate for uh, PCI. Um, and before going to the uh, thing, I, I want to sh share with you this angiography. And um, as you can see, uh, starting from the RCA, the RCA has um, calcified lesion in the prox and mid. And uh, this LED diagonal bifurcation is heavily calcified. And I would say this is a kind of a Medina 111 uh, uh, bifurcation, true bifurcation calcification. Um, so uh, we weren't really sure um, about the hemodynamic significance of the RCA. So an IFR of the RCA was performed, which was 0 0.7. At the same time, an IFR of the LAD was also performed, which was 0 
0.85. Note that this was a IFR. So both these lesions were hemodynamically significant. After a heart team approach, uh, she um, uh, went for um, coronary uh, revascularization. And again, here we achieved um, um, near uh, complete revascularization. We did a IVAS guided provisional LAD stenting along with IVAS guided RCA stenting with good angiographical results. Um, and this was done in two stage procedure. It was an ultra low contrast PCI. Um, given the GFR was less than 30 in her case. Um, and quickly moving over, this is her uh, echocardiograms at two months, which was done by uh, the referring doctor. Um, and um, as you can see, and this will play, um, that the EF has, has recovered. And the grade three diastolic dysfunction uh, for which the patient walked in, now it's like grade one diastolic dysfunction with normal LV filling pressures. So that was a kind of a success of outpatient. We had an outpatient referral um, and uh, it is very um, delighting to see this um, sort of improvement. Um, and this RV also recovered. And her um, at follow-up, we saw at follow-up, um, um, and she was doing well and she continues to be on GDMT for heart failure with recovered EF and we're given the multi-vessel nature we're continuing DAP for one year. So one quick question did, did she have viability or ischemia so evaluation? This was, yeah so this was uh, not done as a viability there was no viability testing that mm -hmm. we done on this patient so there was significant concerns uh, for her she's a claustrophobic uh, lady and she was a smoker so we offered her the CMR but the CMR uh, said that it was GFR was too low they could have done with the iron loading um, but with the significant claustrophobia she uh, was very hesitant what, what's the GFR now has it uh, so the GFR actually the creatinine remained stable throughout very we good. we did not see any we did see an initial bump with yeah. the creatinine one to three point oh four after the second revascularization, but then GFR had now normalized. So she follows it one of our sister Baytown institution, mm. and she follows there. I, I remember this case. This case actually uh, again had a heart team approach. We had surgical consultation. She was a surgical turn down just given her multiple multiple Correct. comorbidities, um, and. Um, uh, again, uh, we were successful in revascularizing, achieving s complete revascularization. So it's good to see those follow-up echocardiography. But uh, again, this could be multifactorial. Um, uh, uh, but these cases do show that there is clearly a role, probably a benefit of at least LVEF improvement. Do not, cannot comment, should not comment on mortality. Correct. Um, but maybe there is an improvement or ejection fraction in selected patients. Yeah. I think I think it's also important to acknowledge that the initial echoes look so terrible that it's easy to give up on the heart, right? If Correct. you think about the classic e echo criteria, yeah. I think in, in, in heart failure, that's what I mean, we always say, just because your LV is dilated or the wall looks thin on the echocardiogram, you shouldn't use that as a reason not to offer therapies. Yeah. I think systematic approach of, of trying to look at the options and alternatives are probably relevant. Uh, so maybe in the, for the uh, sake of time, we'll move on to the last case that I you have. Uh, yeah, I think the last case we have is the most interesting. <laughs> Saved the best for the last. So this is uh, a case that was uh, an outside hospital transfer for LVAD evaluation. Um, so this is a 72-year-old gentleman um, who um, presented acute on chronic heart failure, uh, transfer from outside for consideration of LVAD. Um, the, so the patient was transferred on low dose dibutamine 2.5, Lasix drip and heparin drip. They had tried to put him on some sort of low dose um, GDMT, but they had failed. He had a creatinine of uh, 1.57, BNP was through the roof towards the order of 4,000. Sodium was low, prealbumin was low. Uh, his past medical history was that he had an MI in 2008 and he had a PCI to an unknown vessel. His EF is in less than 20%. He had a um, AICD um, about in 2014 and uh, he had AFib 
um, on Lodo's Eloquus, given recurrent GI bleeds. Um, he had a spec at outside hospital, which was negative for ischemia. Um, uh, so he was um, um, sent our way for consideration of um, kind of no option patient and consideration for LVAD. So his EF, uh, so his EKG, um, it's paced rhythm, but underlying uh, is AFib with a left bundle. Um, chest x-ray, some bibasilar congestion. Uh, moving on to an echo. Um, um, you can see severely depressed EF, large dilated LV cavity, RV is depressed. You can see that pacemaker in the RA and RV, um, dilated ventricle, global hypokinesis. There is some suggestion that there is something going on in the apex. Um, and uh, um, we can see that there is a, also an LV apical thrombus there. Um, so all in all, everything is suggesting a severe Um, reduced EF, biventricular failure with an LV thrombus and LV apex. Um, and um, there was, we I don't have colored opera pictures, but there was at least suspected moderate MR as well. Um, and his PS systolic pressures on this echocardiogram were 55 with a mean right atrial pressure of 15. Um, so in this patient, given he had a normal spec, but there was this LV apical thrombus, he had a history of old MI. So we went with a, uh, we knew that the spec was negative, but we still went with a cardiac PET testing um, for a couple of reasons for to see if there really is any uh, ischemia, um, how are the reserves, and is there any viability. Um, so this was his cardiac PET um, test that was done, which was actually no evidence of ischemia. Um, however, um, uh, there was reduced ejection fraction and you can see on the bottom screen, there's the flow reserves were down in all three vascular territories. There was a small apical fixed defect, um, which doesn't come to us as a surprise because there was an LV apical thrombus and we, 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 we knew that there was some regional wall motion abnormalities and if I had to guess, the MI that he had was an LAD MI. Um, and uh, the viability testing showed that all of the RCA and the circumflex territories uh, are viable. So with this, that the, all the territories have low global flow reserves, myocardial flow reserves, and um, there is a history of coronary artery disease. Um, we, we went with a cardiac catheterization and lo and behold, um, this is the right coronary artery, right coronary artery in the mid segment, there is moderate to severe stenosis. Um, it's STEMI3 flow, but a heavily calcified vessel uh, with moderate to severe stenosis in the mid RCA, but this is when what we saw on the left system. There was critical stenosis of the osteal left main, um, and there was um, dampening of the pressures with ventricularization as well on catheter engagement. There is a large diagonal slash ramus that is coming on, and it has kind of severe stenosis. The patent stent in the LAD is patent, However, there's this large uh, diagonal that is supplying the entire infralateral wall that is um, severely stenosed. Um, so with that, um, uh, our advanced heart failure team was involved. And um, given that this patient was basically in low flow state on dibutamine, uh, we elected to do um, high risk, uh, complex high risk PCI. Uh, the problem, you know, and Dr. Shai uh, went over it, and this patient is, is the one that, according to Jamie McCabe's algorithm, would check at least, if not all, four out of five bo four boxes. Um, he has low EF, cardiogenic shock, multivessel PCI, two vascular territories. Uh, however, he also has an LV thrombus. Um, so for this, we kind of um, bite the bullet and did a, a high-risk PCI with intraaortic balloon pump support. Um, um, so here's you can see that we did uh, this PCI of the RCA as well as 
the diagonal uh, and the left main. So we did left main PCI that uh, PCI to the diagonal slash ramus. Um, in some views, it looked like a ramus, but yeah, it, um, the damus kind of a, uh, PCI. We did a IVAS guided PCI of the left main and a PCI of the RCA. Um, and uh, this is kind of his follow-up. So he was weaned off on dibutamine and intradiagonal pump on day three. He was stabilized in oral doses of diuretics and successfully transferred to the floors. And then he tolerated a trial of GDMT of heart failure with reduced if, and he was discharged on low dose of beta blockers and sacubitril valsartan and daily diuretics, and he was discharged home with cardiac rehab. So this is this tells us that this is a patient that was transferred for LVAD evaluation, underwent revascularization of left main and multivessel revascularization, and actually walks home with outpatient cardiac rehab. This is his follow-up echo at three months uh, on anticoagulation and uh, antiplatelet therapy. And you can see that the LV thrombus has resolved. There is this apical aneurysm that still remains, but the uh, EF has, which was less than 15%, now has recovered to about biplane EF of about 30%. Um, and the RV systolic function, which was severely depressed, is now kind of mild to moderately depressed. Um, and his PS systolic pressures have reduced from 50s to 35. Um, and he completed his dual antithrombotic therapy for six months. Um, and uh, a biventricular ICD was later, after revascularization, he had an underlying left bundle branch block, so he was upgraded to a CRT device uh, at about three months. And he's currently NYHA class two heart failure and tolerating GDMT for heart failure. Thank you, Hassan. That, that's actually a very telling um, case to, to reflect on the fact that heart failure programs are very codependent on strong interventional EP and the approach for us to make sure that we are appropriately selecting individuals and calling them end stage versus advanced heart failure. I think, and, and it, it takes a team effort and as Dr. Shah had mentioned, the heart team concept uh, includes uh, not just surgeons and, and a particular subspecialty but it's all these aspects of care that has successfully led, in one essence, avoiding cardiac replacement in these individuals, and that should be the crux of it. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, we're, we're very grateful for all the cases and both Thank of you. your time. We're definitely over the hour. Uh, we're, we're very appreciative and thankful for the, the Debeki Studio team here for uh, you know, facilitating this. Um, and uh, any last comments, uh, Dr. Shah, before we wrap up? No, I think, uh, thank you again, Dr. Binraj. We, we had a fantastic conversation. Great cases, Hassan. Fantastic job. I think, uh, it, you know, it jogs my memory back. I just want to add one thing. As often we see in our field, all aspects of medicine, there is always this disconnect between what we think a trial should show and what it does not show. And is that, is that because of patient selection? Is that just because of reality of uh, patient's care versus randomized control trial, which are cherry picked and so on and so forth? When we look at data of revived, sometimes you have to stay, take a step back and say, well, maybe we should not be doing PCIs to improve EF or reduce mortality. But then you see cases like that, and this is very encouraging. So I think it goes down to patient selection and a good heart team approach. But again, thank you so much for having us. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you very much, thank Dr. Sun, for your uh, great cases. And thank you all for watching tonight, and uh, hope you have a wonderful evening, and we'll watch you, uh, wait for you back on the Heart Failure Hour in a quarter. <laughs>